<laughs> well, welcome back anyway. We're glad to see you. Okay, who knows what we're celebrating this week at Snow College? I think I heard it. What was it? Engineering week, exactly, yes. Okay, a couple of quick announcements and then we'll get going on today's presentation. We have a lot, of, a lot going on this week and next week. If you haven't done your cultural events for the class, we have a lot to choose from. Tonight and tomorrow night here in the concert hall at 7.30, the Trent Hanna, uh, Trent, there's a Trent Hanna recital, so don't miss that. Also, this coming Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, there will be a chamber music concert here at 7.30. There are also other things, art exhibits and whatnot. They're all posted on Canvas and also on the Snow College uh, calendar, so check those out. Next week, we will have a speaker uh, coming to help us kick off April, which is the Sexual Assault Awareness Month. That speaker is Justin Boardman. He's a retired detective, private detective. He's also on the Utah Board of Directors for the Utah Coalition Against Sexual Assault. So bring your friends. That will be a very important presentation to hear. So this week, before we start with our presentation, we're going to start off with a quartet, a clarinet quartet by students, from, students and faculty from our Snow College Horn of, School of Horn of Music. So please welcome... Uh, four of our music students, and they will be playing Carnival of Venice. So give them a warm welcome.
Weren't they great? Give it up one more time for the Clarinet Quartet. All right, thank you. We're excited today to, to have um, presenter with us, Randy Beard. He received his PhD in electrical engineering from RPI, and since then he's been up at Brigham Young University, the, the college up at, to the north of us. And he teaches in electrical and computer engineering, where he's con currently a professor in feed, teaches courses in feedback control, robotics, and computer vision. His research is focused on autonomous robotic systems, unmanned air vehicles, and multiple vehicle coordination and control. He was a pr principal designer of the Kestrel Autopilot System, which resulted in a spin-off company that was acquired by Lockheed Martin in 2012. He has several awards, including Outstanding Teacher Award from the Electro Electrical and Computer Engineering Department at BYU, the BYU Technology Transfer Award, and the Carl G. Mazur Distinguished Lecturer Award. He's also the proud father of four daughters and one beautiful granddaughter who happens to live just a block away from Snow College. So please help me give a warm welcome to Randy Beard. Thank you. It's a, it's a privilege to be here at Snow College. Uh, I'm grateful for the opportunity to come and talk a little bit about our work uh, in autonomous vehicles at BYU. Uh, I've given a number of different uh, technical presentations over the year, but have never had the opportunity to follow a clarinet quartet. So this is, uh, this is a great privilege for me. So I'm going to talk a little softer. Let's see. Uh, so the outline of my talk today, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, what seems to be the, a drone revolution that's happening right now and uh, give a little bit of an explanation about why it's happening right now and then also talk about uh, kind of at a high level how self-driving vehicles work and do that in the context of some of the research that we've been doing at BYU uh, to help you understand a little bit about how this technology works and, and what's happening behind the scenes. And then uh, talk a little bit of, about the end, uh, about how, or where this technology is going. So autonomous vehicles seem to be everywhere. Uh, you can go to Walmart and buy a Roomba vacuum robot, right? The, uh, and this is a, actually a pretty sophisticated little machine. It'll drive around your house. Uh, it'll explore uh, the house, create its own maps, detect dirt, avoid obstacles and people, uh, and then when it's done and needs a charge, it'll, it'll park itself back and, and uh, get a charge. It has problems with stairways and things like that, but uh, it's a pretty amazing uh, vehicle. So the, uh, the Mars rover was one of the first uh, autonomous vehicles to gain a lot of attention. So the first uh, Mars rover uh, went to Mars in, in 1997, lasted for a few months, and then the second one actually uh, lasted for almost seven years on the surface of Mars until uh, there was a malfunction. There's currently two uh, rovers on Mars that have been there uh, for many years now, and uh, uh, people back at, at uh, the ground station here on Earth will direct uh, these things, but uh, after giving high-level directives, the vehicle wanders around and, and does its uh, different science experiments. So, uh, self-driving Uber, this was in the news actually uh, this week, uh, so there was, uh, unfortunately, there was a, a pedestrian that was killed by a, a self-driving Uber. This is the first accident that's happened, but uh, until that time, um, you could order up an Uber and specify that you, in, in Tempe, Arizona at least, and specify that you wanted to be self-driving. And when you got there, there'd be a person st uh, sitting in the driver's seat, but he wouldn't touch the wheels or do anything. It's completely, he's there uh, basically for safety's sake, and uh, he, he doesn't do anything. The interesting thing about the self-driving cars in Tempe, Arizona, they are actually driven to Tempe from Pittsburgh uh, using a self-driving truck. <laughs> Um, so one of the uh, uh, autonomous vehicles that uh, you may have heard about in terms of military uh, airplanes is the Predator drone. Uh, and this is an aircraft that uh, it's actually flown by people, um, and so it requires pilots, but the pilots will sit, say, in Las Vegas flying an aircraft that's in Afghanistan. And so it's done uh, completely remotely. 
Uh, of course, you can uh, go to Walmart and buy a, uh, a drone that has a, a camera on it, or you can order parts off the internet and get a, a tiny whoop. It's got a little camera. You can't really see it uh, on this picture uh, very well, but you can build these things. And it's actually uh, self, these things are self-stabilized, but uh, controlled from a, a radio control um, uh, unit. Uh, a little more sophisticated is, for example, the DJI Mavic. Uh, and this requires an operator, but has a lot of onboard uh, sensors. Uh, mostly cameras, but also uh, sonar and, and a uh, laser uh, altimeter, and will fly around, avoid obstacles, um, and has GPS, will return to home. Uh, you can tell it to follow you, and, or follow me, and it will follow you around. Uh, so pretty sophisticated uh, little machine. So the self-driving car industry, actually, uh, in thinking about autonomy, um, has five different levels of autonomy. So, of course, level zero of autonomy uh, would be uh, a human, let's see if I can actually point. So, for example, uh, a car uh, where the human's completely driving, there's no autonomy at all. Uh, and now we can buy cars that uh, we have, you know, uh, lane assist and will, uh, or uh, variable um, speed control. So, for example, you set the, uh, um, you set the speed control, and if, uh, if you're going 40 miles an hour but somebody stopped in the road, it'll actually stop for you. That would be like level one autonomy. And then level two autonomy, uh, the human is actually monitoring, but the car will drive. So for example, uh, Tesla has uh, vehicles now where you can specify to uh, you know, drive to a certain location uh, in town, and it'll actually change lanes and stop at stop signs and, and turn for you but uh, requires the human to be there and will we'll actually say, put your hands on the steering wheel, you know, to, uh, because uh, at any point the human needs to take over. Then you have level three autonomy where, um, you know, this would be more like the uh, uh, self-driving Uber where the human is there, can take control if needed, but essentially the vehicle, uh, the autonomy uh, software uh, is running and driving the car. Level four would be uh, something where the human could actually uh, go to sleep, and um, it'll wake you up if necessary, but uh, uh, is doing all, everything essentially by itself, but uh, is limited to, for example, good uh, weather conditions. And then level five autonomy would be a vehicle where the human really does nothing and has no ability to do anything, and the, uh, uh, the robot is, is doing everything. So, in terms of what I just talked about, um, you know, level zero, for example, a radio-controlled uh, aircraft where the, uh, the operator is uh, controlling the, the flaps on the airplane would be level zero. Uh, things like a uh, Predator drone or even this little tiny whoop, this would be level one autonomy that's actually computer stabilized, but the human is, is uh, directing the vehicle in every other aspect. Level two would be uh, vehicles like the DJI Mavic that has sensors on board. We'll do uh, collision avoidance and whatever, but then you have uh, the pilot that's really directing where it goes. Level three would be, for example, a self-driving taxi where the driver still is required to be in the car, but only takes over as necessary. The Mars rover, where the operator is really specifying where to go and what to do. This would be level four autonomy. And you know the Roomba vacuum, this is, uh, you can turn it on and until it breaks or, or falls down the stairs or whatever, it'll just do its thing. You don't have to do anything to, uh, uh, just to tell it what to do. Okay, so why is this all happening right now? It seems like uh, autonomous vehicles are just sort of exploding uh, in the news and uh, availability commercially. Um, so universities have been doing research on autonomous vehicles since the 1960s. Uh, but, uh, and I, you know, I was in, I was uh, getting my PhD during the, uh, the 1990s. And there was a lot of work on autonomous vehicles, but there was a real explosion that sort of happened uh, around the year 2000. So what was it? There's actually uh, four key technologies that really came online uh, in the, uh, around the year 2000. So one is GPS. Um, so GPS, you know, uh, it's actually been around for a while, but the full constellation of satellites wasn't available until 1993. And then uh, selective uh, availability. So GPS actually, they introduced an artificial signal into GPS where you could only get a couple hundred meters of accuracy. 
Uh, and then the military finally turned off selective availability so that everybody could get accuracy down to about five meters. And that didn't happen until the year 2000. And, you know, it's continued to progress. So actually, 2018, they're going to introduce additional uh, uh, really software uh, approaches that will allow commercial products, they say, to get down to about uh, one foot. So another technology that's really driven um, what's happening in autonomous vehicles is uh, MEMS gyros and accelerometers. So a gyroscope is a, uh, is a device that measures the angular velocity of a vehicle. So to, to be able to fly an airplane, you, you need to know how it's rotating. So like, for example, the, uh, a small drone that you buy at Walmart or whatever, you actually, uh, quad rotors, if you try to fly them directly from an RC transmitter, you can't fly the vehicle. They just react too fast. And so you have to have uh, a computer-stabilized uh, mechanism. And the way it does that is it senses the rotation. It uses a gyroscope to sense when it's rotating and then counteracts that rotation. So it, it really slows the vehicle down so that a pilot can, you know, a human can use their eyes and, and steer this thing around. So gyroscopes are necessary to, uh, to fly an airplane. Uh, accelerometers measure acceleration. They're also used to, to fly airplanes. Uh, it turns out gy gyroscopes and accelerometers, of course, have been around for a long time. You, uh, to be able to uh, fly a missile or, or whatever, things that were happening back in World War II, they had to have gyroscopes and accelerometers. But they're big and heavy mechanical systems. Uh, and, you know, up until around 2000, a, a good gyroscope, you know, may cost 10, uh, you know, uh, the cheap, on the cheap end, $10,000. On the expensive end, millions of dollars. And... Um, so in, around the year 2000, MEMS uh, is a, uh, it's a technology that allows small machines to be built on silicon wafers. So they can actually have little vibrating levers and things that, uh, that you embed onto a computer chip. And these things ha have changed everything. So uh, 2002, there was the first commercially available uh, accelerometer, and it was basically used to detect collisions in cars and deploy an airbag. And uh, now, you know, MEMS are everywhere. So, you know, I have a, 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 a Fitbit on my arm, and, and it can tell when I walk. And so every step, it has an accelerometer on board that's simply measuring acceleration and, and figuring out uh, when I take a step. Uh, every cell phone now has gyros and accelerometers and GPS on board. Uh, the Nintendo Wii, so that's how a, an acceler a gyroscope is how it tells how you're rotating or maneuvering that Wii. And these things are very uh, cheap now. You can buy a three-axis accelerometer for about $10. Uh, another uh, technology that really happened, kind of came into its own in the early uh, 2000s, were embedded computers. So uh, in, the, in the 1990s, early 1990s, uh, you had the invention of flash memory which uh, enabled very small computers that had enough memory to actually do something. And really, in the late 1990s, you had a microcontroller uh, come on the market that was um, small enough but powerful enough to, to fly an airplane. Uh, and then, you know, it's continued to progress at an incredible rate. And now, a few years ago, uh, NVIDIA here, uh, released an embedded computer, you know, just uh, something very small, lightweight, the, the Jetson series that um, can actually do machine learning and computer vision. And so it's amazing what you can do in a very small package these days. And then the fourth technology that's really driven everything is, is uh, lithium polymer batteries, which again uh, commercially became available in the early uh, 2000s. So these enabling technologies, the, the other thing that's happened is not only have these technologies become available, but they also were synergistic with a lot of consumer products. So for example, cell phones and and uh, game devices, uh, cameras, and you know, even now our, our smart watches, they all have GPS, accelerometers, and gyros, uh, small computers, and LiPo batteries. So really the consumer market, where there's millions uh, of uh, products that can be sold, have driven uh, this technology where it's cheap and lightweight. And that has all been a boon to, uh, to robotics. Okay, so how do, uh, how, how do self-driving vehicles work? So just at a high level, every self-driving car or self-flying vehicle um, has at its core uh, a software and hardware architecture that looks something like this. You've got the aircraft or the self-driving car, 
and then two different types of sensors. One would be flight sensors. So, if, for example, accelerometers and gyros, these are flight sensors. They're on board, they measure for what the vehicle is doing. Um, an odometer on a self driving car would be the same sort of thing. And then uh, there's another type of sensor, uh, the, what I call environmental sensors. So these would be cameras, GPS, LIDAR, sonar, uh, that really sense the environment. Um, and so a self-driving car needs to not only know what it's doing so that it can perform what, what's called state estimation, it can figure out how, where its position and orientation is with respect to the world, and then control the vehicle uh, in a stable way. It also has to, we also need these environmental sensors that can detect things in the environment and then uh, perform a task which uh, I call perception, which is to perceive, for example, if you're a self-driving car, you need to perceive that there's people that are walking alongside the roadway and, and might cross in front of you, and then do prediction, figure out, okay, where is that person going into the future, and how should I then plan my path to react to uh, that predicted location of the world a few seconds from now. So self-driving cars have that. And what I'm going to talk about, I, I'm going to uh, actually uh, describe research in, in, that we've been doing at, at BYU. Uh, we've been working in all of these different areas. And I'll just describe a few of the projects that we've been doing to give you a sense. So for example, on a self-driving car, you know, you've got your onboard uh, computer. It'll have uh, you know, an IMU with accelerometers and gyros. But, and you'll have wheel encoders. Those are sort of the internal sensors. But then a self-driving car will also have GPS, it'll have a LIDAR, so that, that funny spinning thing on top, it's just a laser that's spinning around and can detect uh, obstacles in the environment uh, up to uh, maybe 100 meters. And then you've got cameras um, and right radar, and what a self-driving car is doing is taking inputs from all of these different sensors to perceive the environment and then predict ahead using physics uh, and then do planning based on that. Okay, so uh, I'll come back and talk about that a little bit. So uh, let me just talk about that, uh, that diagram, I guess, in the context of current research. Uh, talk a little bit about autopilot design, some of the things we've been doing in terms of perception, and then prediction and planning. Okay, so uh, we've been doing uh, research in, in uh, unmanned air vehicles for almost 20 years now at BYU. This is a picture from a couple of years ago. Uh, we have a number of different platforms, uh, flying wings, but also multi-rotors. There's a, actually you can't see it very well, but it's a, it's a tail sitter. It takes off and lands on its tail and then flops over and flies like a fixed wing vehicle. So we've had a lot of fun with all these different vehicles. And we've been doing things, um, whoops, uh, in kind of four general categories where we've been looking at autopilot design and then uh, you know, how do you use sensors like uh, vision and radar to fly the vehicle, and then path planning, trajectory generation. And then I won't talk at all today about uh, cooperative control, but we've also done work where you get multiple vehicles to then autonomously work together to accomplish some task. Uh, and this is, uh, you know, we're teamed right now with uh, several other universities and a number of different companies, um, and so we have, uh, we're having a lot of fun. So early work on uh, the Kestrel autopilot. So this uh, is things that we did in the early uh, 2000s. Uh, we developed this small autopilot. Uh, you can see this is a quarter. And so it's, it's small. It can fly. This is a small handheld uh, UAV. It could actually fly a large aircraft as well. But there you, would, uh, you actually have uh, enough payload to carry uh, a, a bigger computer. And it does all sorts of different things. We were playing with uh, optic flow sensors, and we'd you know, fly in very heavy wind, wind conditions. And uh, we you know, use this on a number of different platforms. And it actually spun out of BYU uh, into a company, Proceris, and then uh, it's now uh, being used uh, in products uh, Lockheed Martin. This is uh, just a video. It's kind of fun. It's, it's almost uh, 10, 12 years old now, but this is early things that we were doing, uh, flying, so this is Goshen Canyon, and uh, we basically told it to go straight through the canyon, and then it's using optic flow, so it has small little cameras that figure out how things are flowing through the camera, and then we use that to actually uh, guide it through uh, Goshen Canyon. Um, this is uh, uh, some of the work we were doing in multi-vehicle systems, so we're up flying uh, aircraft at the same time, doing formation flying and other uh, types of 
projects, and then, um, I don't know, later on, yeah, this is kind of fun, get a, a view. So we actually had a mid-air collision here. This is, uh, and the aircraft, turns out, recovers just fine. So you can sense that and uh, maneuver the vehicle. We were doing some stuff on simultaneous arrival, uh, where we're trying to get multiple vehicles to arrive at the same time. So this is a, a video. You might be able to see uh, this vehicle and then others coming in at the same time. Doing that in, in wind conditions. Um, all right, so uh, that's some of the work that we did on, uh, in autopilot systems. Uh, and let me describe now perception uh, and spend uh, most of my time, I guess, uh, talking about some of the things that we do here. So if you put a camera on an autonomous vehicle, okay, you want to get, you want to have that vehicle now see. Uh, and it's actually a very hard problem to do. Why is it hard? Because like we look at, if we're flying along, we look at the scene and this is what we see. Well, what does the computer see? These are just a bunch of numbers <laughs> between 0 and 256, right? That's what a computer sees. It sees uh, an array, actually three arrays of numbers, one for red, one for green, one for blue, and it gets a new array every 30th of a second, you know, 30 times a second. So um, uh, you get all these numbers coming in, and what you want to then do is write computer algorithms to figure out, okay, there's a building there, or there's something that's coming at me that I need to avoid. Uh, and how do you do that? So that's this, uh, this um, area of computer vision. So this is, uh, this is a particular project that we've been working on, still have uh, ongoing projects where we're uh, tracking multiple, vehicle, or multiple objects in the environment using, um, using unmanned air vehicles. And the first thing you have to do is detect you know, the targets or the objects in the environment that are moving. And it's made hard by the fact that you're moving, right? So you move, and so the scene is moving because of your motion. Things that are stationary are moving because of your motion. And what you have to do is detect your own motion, and then things that are moving in addition to you. And so it's, uh, it becomes an interesting uh, task. OK, so how does, how does that work? Um, so what we do is you, you're getting frames, you know, these video frames uh, at about, uh, you know, uh, 30 times a second. And what you do is take subsequent frames. And from the subsequent frames, actually, the first thing you do is estimate sort of the average motion of these frames and then um, subtract that out. And once we subtract out that average motion or we push this frame into the, uh, into the I guess, uh, to be aligned with this one, uh, then we can take a difference. And when we take a difference, we see things that are moving on top of uh, our motion. And then we can use that as a mask to find different features. And then what you do is you say, OK, if something is uh, moving in the environment, it's going to move according to some physical law. Like, for example, people may walk in straight lines, right? So they have a constant velocity vector. So we, we basically fit trajectories uh, based on these mathematical models. And uh, we can base those, fit those trajectories. And things that show up in, the, uh, in our mask that don't fit that model, we just throw out. And everything else we, uh, we say is a, an object. OK, so there's many different uh, applications of this technology. So potential applications, uh, search and rescue, where you're trying to follow and then uh, report back. Things like uh, wildlife monitoring, where you're following, you're trying, this is using a uh, an IR sensor to uh, detect uh, wildlife. Um, and so there's plenty of applications uh, of that technology. Another, another project that we've been doing recently is uh, what I call indoor flight, obstacle avoidance. What we're doing here is you fly down the hallway and then you use, uh, you build up a map of the environment. So this is a point cloud that shows you different features that we're tracking in the environment. You can see here's the desk and the chairs. And then when we detect objects that need to be avoided, we have these little yellow circles. And so you can start planning paths through the environment that you sense. OK, so how does this work? Uh, the basic technology is, you, you know, again, you get, you're having subsequent frames. And in the first frame, you find corners. So it turns out the corners are fairly easy to find in an image. So you find a bunch of corners. Then you find corners in the second image, and you match them up. Uh, so this corner goes to that corner. And then from the match, uh, you can actually then um, uh, find, you can triangulate to find points in the environment. And then given those points in the environment, you create what we call a voxel grid instead of a pixel. 
uh, grid, we have a three-dimensional pixels, they're voxels, and then we build up this map of the environment, and we can plan paths through that environment uh, given the map. So there's, uh, again, nice applications here, plenty of applications, but one is, uh, you know, you can really make cool sports videos, right, if you're following uh, the guy on the mountain bike, avoiding trees and, and doing things. This is the type of, uh, of application that that technology enables. Okay, so another uh, project that we're doing is what I call GPS uh, denied navigation. So GPS is great as long as it works, right? So if you get, uh, so GPS requires four different satellite signals to be able to tri triangulate your location on Earth. Um, and if you're ever in an environment where you don't see four satellites, GPS won't work. So for example, a room like this, uh, where we've got a lot of steel beams overhead, uh, those block out the signal, and so GPS doesn't work very well indoors. Or if we're in urban environments where buildings are blocking our views to four satellites, GPS doesn't work. And so uh, we're doing uh, a number of things where we're trying to fly uh, through these different environments. So actually here we have several sensors. Uh, we've got a LiDAR, which is detecting things in the environment, plus um, our camera, and uh, uh, it tells us essentially uh, where things are. And then we essentially build up this map of the environment, but we don't know, for example, uh, where, we, where we are in the world until at some point we might get a GPS location. So when we go outside, we'll occasionally pick up GPS. And when we pick up GPS, we can take this map where right now we don't know where it is in the world, and all of a sudden I recognize, oh, I'm on BYU campus, right, flying through these buildings. And uh, as I receive more and more GPS uh, positions, I can uh, detect where I'm at. So how does this work? Uh, so the basic technology. So we, we basically start out somewhere in the world. We don't know where, but we'll call that the zero point. And we take a picture. Uh, so we have an image of, of what we're seeing at the current time. And then what we do is we fly relative to that, that picture. And we can use uh, our motion relative to the image that we just saw to build up a transformation that says, okay, I, I, I moved and rotated by this amount. And then after uh, that picture goes outside of my field of view, I have to establish a new point and navigate then relative to that. And I, I always keep track of these pictures that I've taken and how I, you know, the, the rotation and translation it took to get there. And I just continue to, to do that. Um, building up this uh, map of the environment until I come back to a location where I see something that I've seen before. We call that a loop closure. And when that happens, we can then rectify uh, the map and, and uh, uh, fix uh, all of the, the uncertainties that happen. So there's many applications to that technology. So one of the big ones is infrastructure inspection. So there's a lot of bridges in the United States that uh, have structural uh, damages and, or, or issues. And right now, you know, this is one of the ways that they inspect. They have a big arm and there's people standing on this platform looking at the bridge. So it's much easier to just fly an autonomous vehicle uh, down and inspect bridges. And this is something that you want to do autonomously because uh, there's so many of them and you want to do it very quickly. Okay, so in terms of perception and planning, um, let me uh, just say, here's a, a fun project that we did a few years ago. So this is a red truck. Here's the autonomous air vehicle. It's actually looking for the biggest red object to land on. And luckily it saw that and not the stop sign. <laughs> this is another view uh, of, uh, of that same scene. So it comes down, it's looking for the biggest red thing to land on. Lands in the back. And uh, that was actually the third uh, run of, uh, of the day. The first one, um, you'll see what happens. It comes down and hits the tailgate. It's almost on, but uh, hits the tailgate and gets run over. Sad day, but actually uh, flew after that. Um, and it's similar technology here where you've got a user that's pinpointing saying, okay, I want to land on this particular, this is a Humvee, it's landing in the back of this Humvee, and then the autonomy takes over does everything until uh, the computer vision algorithm, um, in this case, gets a little bit off and a user assists it at the end. So this would be like a level two autonomy uh, system <coughs> landing. Uh, so how did, uh, but the, the landing algorithm at least is completely autonomous. So how does that work? 
Um, so the, the basic technology has been around, or the idea has been around for a long time. It's been used in ship navigation. So if you're trying to, uh, you know, if you're a pirate ship trying to track uh, uh, another uh, ship, uh, basically what you do is you keep that ship fixed with respect to the uh, uh, with respect to the hull. And so for a UAV with a forward-looking camera, what you want to do is you want to keep the target that you're trying to land on fixed in the field of view, you know, at a fixed location in the camera. And so the algorithm is fairly simple. You find the, uh, at least in that last video, you find the largest red blob, and then you steer the aircraft so that the blob doesn't move in the image. And if you do that, uh, you'll eventually land on it. Oops, sorry. Uh, and many, uh, many different uh, potential applications, so there's convoy support, and then drone delivery, you may have seen these, uh, these videos from Amazon where you order something and then eventually it, it lands and delivers it at your doorstep. So this is the same types of technology. We've also been doing work in uh, perception and planning and uh, where we're flying through urban terrain doing uh, collision avoidance and I think I'll, uh, I'll uh, skip that a little bit. So let me just say one thing about path planning. How does path planning work? Um, so with an autonomous vehicle, uh, it's going to perceive what's happening in the environment and then plan paths through that environment. This is a, let me just describe an algorithm that is similar to many things that are working on autonomous vehicles. So this is, a, this is one that's very uh, easy to describe. It's called the Rapidly Exploring Random Tree, RRT algorithm. And the way it works is really simple. You have a start location, an end location, objects that you want to avoid, and the algorithm starts by, whoops, by picking a random point in the environment, P. And then it creates what we call a tree. It's gonna be this little graph through the environment. And what you do is extend towards that random point by some distance D. And then you pick another random point in the environment, you find the closest point in that tree and extend towards that by that distance D. If you ever get the point where uh, the closest point, uh, when you extend that closest point, there's an, a collision, you just throw that one out. And, and randomly sample again. And if you keep doing that, you'll end up with something that eventually the endpoint is close to one of your nodes and you can connect it, and now you have a path through the environment. This type of algorithm is used uh, in a variety of different settings. One, you know, like planning paths through uh, objects, uh, those objects, you can actually have, uh, take into account steering constraints, uh, so self-driving cars through a, through a turn like this uh, can use that type of algorithm. Actually. Uh, manufacturing systems where you have robot arms that are reaching in and through things. You can even use it to solve, uh, you know, the types of puzzles that drive us crazy. Um, so path, that type of path planning uh, is pretty interesting. All right, so let's kind of uh, uh, look into the future. Where are we going? There's really two trends right now that are converging. Uh, one is the uh, unmanned aircraft systems. Uh, and so this, this trend and also the self-driving car uh, trend is beginning to now converge. And we're talking about personal, self-piloted, uh, autonomous flying vehicles. And just in case you think uh, it's, uh, it's far-fetched, uh, this is a video that was released just a week ago by Kitty Hawk. We actually have a number of former students from our lab working at Kitty Hawk, so it's exciting to see this type of thing. This is a real vehicle takes off and lands uh, vertically. Uh, it has funny looking propellers because they're designed to be quiet. Um, this vehicle is completely self-driving. So you get in, you dial into your uh, iPad, say this is where I wanna go, and it flies you there. It's, complete, it's all electric um, and uh, has about a 50 minute uh, flight time, so 60 miles uh, range. And they plan to start offering uh, taxi services in Australia in 2021. So self-flying taxis are coming. This is another Kitty Hawk uh, production. And so this is, uh, I, I think, the first flying vehicles that we'll see on the market are these sports utility type, uh, uh, type vehicles. So this is, uh, it's flying over water for safety reasons, but there's no reason uh, it can't fly. It's not a hovercraft, it's actually flying. Um, and so the, it's unlimited altitude and could go wherever. But uh, again, the pilot is, uh, is actually steering the vehicle, but it's uh, pilot assist. And this right now is very noisy. I've, I've actually seen a demonstration. It's, it's uh, quite loud. But um, 
uh, exciting technologies coming in the future. And there's many other companies that are developing this type of technology uh, <clears throat> at the moment. Okay, so before that happens, though, there's a number of different issues that have to be resolved. Uh, one of them is insurance. So, for example, the accident that happened this week, uh, we'll probably see some movement on this front. When uh, somebody gets injured uh, by a self-driving car, you know, the lawyers want to sue somebody, right? So, who do you sue? Do you sue the person who was sitting in the driver's seat but not driving the car? Do you sue the person who owned the self-driving car? Do you sue, uh, sue the, the company that built it? Or do you sue, sue the software engineers who wrote the software? Um, so it's an interesting question that needs to be sorted out. There's also many ethical issues. So for example, with a self-driving car, uh, somebody has to write software that makes decisions that are hard. Like for example, if you're driving down the road and your brakes fail, okay, and there's a brick wall that you could drive into and kill the driver, or there's a, a busy pedestrian sidewalk where you drive and maybe kill a number of pedestrians. Um, we somehow trust a human to make the, a good decision there. Uh, but if it's a self-driving car, you have to write software that makes that decision. And what, what should you do if you're planning for things like that in the future? So there's many ethical questions in terms of how do we write the software to, to have self-driving cars. Air traffic management, if we're going to have things flying all over, how do we manage that, do it in a way that's not disruptive to our way of life, uh, but enables uh, good traffic? And actually, there's a lot of work in this uh, right now uh, with NASA with respect to, to um, manned vehicles, but also uh, self-driving uh, vehicles. A lot of regulatory issues, sense and avoid. So there's, there are technical challenges. So here's my guess at, at a timeline. And like Yogi Berra says, you know, prediction is hard, especially about the future. But why not? Uh, so, you know, about five years in the future, I think uh, we'll have self-flying recreational vehicles that rich people can buy. Uh, we'll have some self-flying taxis, probably not in the United States, but around the world. Um, and then we'll have limited Amazon drone delivery. Ten years out, uh, level four autonomy will probably be standard on all the cars that uh, are available on the market. Uh, self-flying taxis will become uh, more commonplace. We'll have some self-flying cars. Uh, drone delivery will probably be commonplace. 15 years in the future, this is already happening, transition away from car ownership. In big cities, uh, uh, millennials like you are finding it cheaper to just take an Uber everywhere rather than own a car. Uh, Self-flying taxis be will probably be uh, available in limited areas. Um, oh yeah, let's see, that happens after they become common. Whatever. Okay, so self, and then maybe uh, uh, 20 years in the future, self-flying cars are available to the masses, self-flying taxis really become integrated and part of the transportation infrastructure. Okay, so I've talked about uh, this drone revolution that's happening, explain a little bit about why it's happening now, and, uh, and then uh, hopefully giving you a sense, kind of at a high level, of how these vehicles work, and then uh, a few predictions. So there's many technical and economic, regulatory, ethical challenges that have to be addressed. But one thing's for sure, the future of uh, autonomous vehicles is very bright. And just want to acknowledge uh, sponsors for our work, uh, wonderful faculty collaborators, and have had the privilege of working with some really uh, tremendous students over the years. So thank you very much. <clears throat> And it looks like I went a little bit over time, but I could probably take one or two questions. If I can't see very well, but if there are any. OK, and I'll be around uh, for a little bit up here in the front. Feel free to come up and, and uh, ask whatever questions you might have. Thank you. <laughs>